Hi, Peter. It's, it's delightful to have Peter on the, on the robot because uh, about partway through Second Life, I became fascinated with a question. Uh, well, I became fascinated with the idea that this idea of these robots and, uh, and building them. And I actually started, you know, I am want to imagine crazy ideas that I'd like to build, you know, despite whatever I'm working on at the moment. And one of the ones that I remember halfway through Second Life was I was just nuts about this idea. And now there are several companies that are starting to actually build these things. But it actually brings to my mind an interesting question, and I hope that in a wandering talk tonight we can maybe touch on this a little bit, which is um, are we going to extend ourselves in the real world in the way that Peter is doing right now? A robot, uh, he has this ability to remote control it. and and put himself into a kind of a meta, you know, or, or a quasi sort of physical form here? Or are we instead going to digitize everything, uh, title of the talk, or, 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 you know, a big thought, and go inside virtual worlds and do a lot of stuff there, right? And in my mind, and I bet you guys have thought about this, uh, and will think about this, this session perhaps more than I have, it's an interesting question that I don't really know the answer to. Will we do it this way, the, the Peter way, um, or will we do it by continuing to immerse ourselves in virtual worlds to the point where things that we thought we were going to have to solve in reality sort of just don't matter anymore? We, we just do them digitally. And so I thought that was kind of a big thought to talk about. What I, what I hope I can do tonight, and, and hopefully it's different for anybody that saw me here last, uh, the last couple of times, hopefully I'm interestingly different each time I come. Um, and I do that by not planning. Uh, as before, when I was here last time, this is literally a photo stream of images taken from Second Life. So I'm just going to compete with that. And as you can see, I have absolutely no idea what's on there. Um, and, and, and it represents essentially just snapshots that people are taking in Second Life uh, relatively recently, I presume. Generally, there are things people are taking you know, pictures of and uh, holding up as great content or great experiences in Second Life. So, they're evocative. Uh, I always find it you know, amazing to look at them. They show you not only what Second Life is about, I think, in a kind of an odd, indirect, uh, you know, not what I'm telling you way, but perhaps also what people want and want it to be about, more, more so even than what it actually is. And so you see a little bit of the, the, the future here in the sense that you know, this is kind of what people are trying to make of the virtual world at its best uh, versus uh, what it actually is today, and I think that's a very singularity university kind of thing. So getting to come here and talk to everybody is, is like home to me. I, I love the chance to just wander on about subjects that you guys are thinking a lot about. Um, indeed, I think that singularity is, is a group of people, and I, both an idea and a group of people that's kind of uh, uh, maybe smart enough to know that the problem that it's grappling with, the big questions that are being asked here, are basically beyond our ability to answer as human beings. We're, we're just, at least in my mind, you know, we're, we're, we're just really not quite smart enough. And indeed, the near future uh, will bring fascinating changes in terms of, you know, who we are and how smart we are. So I think it's a group that's wise, you know, wise enough to know that we're not even smart enough to grapple with these questions, but fearless enough and, and low enough ego, I guess, in a way, to actually do it anyway, you know, to sort of do our best at taking that stuff on. So, so to me, I think that's what's inspiring about Singularity. And it's also uh, what makes it fun for me to be able to be here and just kind of talk about anything and about stuff really, perhaps related to Second Life or virtual worlds that, frankly, most people wouldn't understand, which I can get back to later. In fact, there's a story related to that that I thought of when I was thinking about what to talk about today that I, I think I didn't tell uh, in other times I've been here. In 1999, when Second Life was getting started, I was a, uh, I was an entrepreneur in residence at a big venture capital firm called Axel. And I remember just, I, I look back on it and with hindsight you say, boy, that was so bizarre. I remember this conversation I was having there with uh, Jim Breyer, who was the managing partner at Axel, and I bet Jim was just thinking, who is this guy? I mean, and I, I had come from Real Networks where I was the CTO. I had quit to start this crazy virtual world stuff. And I was, I, was, I was talking to Jim, and I, I just remember I threw out this bizarre thought that I had been having, and this is before Second Life was built at all. Um, I threw this thought out to him. I said, do you know what tunneling is? Now, I, now this is a class 
Only, only here do I get to like, like how many people know what quantum mechanical tunneling is here, right? Like a lot, I love it. It's my gang. Um, so tunneling, of course, is this phenomena where uh, if you have a marble and you have it a, in a cup and you shake the cup just a little bit, just enough to roll the marble around in the bottom, if it's a big classical marble, you can shake that cup forever. And when you come back, you'll still find the marble in it. You can do it as long as you like. You can do it for a billion years. It doesn't matter. But as you guys probably know, in the quantum mechanical domain, you get this very odd behavior, which is if you shake the cup just a little, and then you come back the next day, marble's gone. It actually just left the cup. It just went through the sidewall of the cup. It, it tunneled as we say in quantum mechanics, through a, a, what's called a classical barrier. It just left. There's a statistical probability that a very small quantum mechanical particle, like an electron, will just leave the container that it's in by way of the wall. And there was this thing that was going on at the time. I was basically starting to do some of the early thinking and engineering around physics simulation in Second Life. And I was encountering this problem, which was that when you try to basically simulate little marbles running into each other in a physics simulator on a computer, that is to say, when you try to redo the laws of physics on a computer, and the computer has only a finite amount of power, you run into this very interesting problem, which is that, well, and I'll, I'll say what the problem is, and then I'll go back to why, but basically, if you leave a marble in a cup in Second Life, and you leave all night, and you come back, what happens? The marble's gone. And it actually turns out that that problem isn't fixable. Now, now people that are really into physics simulation, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't have a PhD in this stuff. It, the solution of how to simulate things physically in a virtual world is a hard problem. There's multiple ways to solve it. But, Basically, if your computer's only so, f what I'm trying to say is, if your computers are only so fast at simulating a virtual world, that is to say, if you have f a finite number of computers and you want to simulate a certain amount of virtual space, you run into this problem, and it turns out you can't solve it, that if you don't want things to bounce out of, if you don't want that little marble to leave the cup that it's in, you actually would have to have an infinite amount of computing power uh, to guarantee that it won't over a certain amount of time. Does everybody sort of see where I'm going with this? So what was just incredibly interesting to me, and I was already very interested in virtual worlds, was this bizarre fact that the computational limits imposed by simulation when you were, doing, when you were simulating a virtual world on a computer essentially resulted in the same kind of, I'm just going to say, uh, artifacts or problems that make quantum mechanics weird. So I think that's fascinating. You know, does that mean we're simulated by computers? I, I don't think it's, I don't know how material a question is. That, that's like a sci-fi question. But I think it tells us something incredibly fascinating about the nature of things, that you would have this oddly similar situation. And it also may make you think something about vir both virtual worlds and the future of our own world as it becomes increasingly virtual. That, uh, and, and this is, you know, poor business advice, I don't know how you translate this into action, you know, as a group of uh, people, many of you, m many of you are, who are thinking about going off and starting companies, but some of the things that we see sort of happening quantum mechanically at a very small scale actually sort of happen in virtual worlds and therefore happen more in our own world as we increasingly simulate it with computers. So I just thought everybody here would enjoy that, that opening thought that I don't think I'd throw out at any other conference or anything. So, th that, this, this then big begs another question, which I think that we ought to think about. And I, I mean, I think what I'll do here is, is talk for a while, and then I, I'd love to have, and we've done this successfully before, more of a kind of a user-directed thing here. Of course, Second Life is very user-created, and so I love to have things be directed. So after a while, I'll stop. And if you want to ask me something uh, while I'm talking here, stop me, do. I, I actually love to you know, not follow the path that I had planned to the extent that I planned it at all. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a big question here, which is the physical world that we live in right now came before us, and it's, it's, it's got some pretty hard and fast rules 
uh, mysterious wonders of quantum mechanics notwithstanding, we live in a world that preceded us uh, by any argument and is, 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 is pretty fixed in its ways. You know, the physical laws are what they are. So there's a fascinating question, and it's the question that inspired me as a kid, and which is why I'm telling you this. Uh, there's a fascinating question, which is, how would we redo everything? If we were recreating the world, if we had sufficient computing power to recreate the world and everything that's inside it, again, uh, oh, there's videos. That's so weird. I hope that doesn't just go on and on. I never know how to get past those in Flickr, but if it does go on forever, you can skip over it. And if you see anything really awful, you can. I'm, this, the gang in the back of the room is controlling my presentation here, so it's perfect. Uh, you know, how would we recreate the rules of the world? How would we, for example, sort of uh, define the underlying laws of physics if we had it all to do over again now? So what do I mean by that? Um, issues come up like uh, atoms in our world, little blobs of things. If we, if we take a lens off a camera here, or if we take a shirt off one of us in this room, it doesn't have anything on it that indicates like who made it or who owns it. It doesn't have any meta data associated with it. It just has atoms. And we can only tell certain things about it from those atoms, which makes you know, forensic science so interesting. We, 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 we can't know exactly anything about stuff but what atoms it's made of. But of course, if you got to redesign the world all over again, you might attach metadata to the atoms, right? You could actually, I suppose, have atoms, if you will, the smallest, most indivisible particles of your new virtual world that actually had like the names of the people who they belong to on them. So that's what I mean by that when I ask that question. And I, I, I mean, this is the kind of thing we all ought to be thinking about a lot because if Second Life is any indication, we're about to have this power to recreate the world uh, in, our own, in our own design, so to speak. And so what kind of stuff do we want? Do we want to have the names of owners on things, right? I think there's a whole uh, uh, group of uh, a direction of discussion here uh, that, uh, that I think Mark is leading that that perhaps contemplates this a little bit. Do we, do we want to have uh, intellectual property in a, in a virtual world? And what kind of intellectual property if we have it? Do we want to know who created something or just who owns it right now? These are the kinds of questions that we got into. Another one would be to the extent that we're trying to make things interactive and interesting in our world, do we do that using uh, atoms or do we do it using what we did in Second Life, which is a scripting language? <laughs> And if we use a scripting language, that is, if we use a language that allows us to describe how little pieces of things interact when they talk to each other, what kind of language? What kind of properties should it have? What an interesting question. The physical world mostly interacts, as you know, with itself with sort of van der Waals forces, right? I mean, everything we do in the real world, practically speaking, is just driven by atoms bumping into each other. Um, but if you get to redesign everything, you could basically do all this weird stuff where you embed a whole bunch of logic and code and things like that into the physics of the new world that you create. So I just, I don't know, I think that stuff's fascinating. And, and so uh, I always thought questions like that were interesting. I'll give you a little bit of my own background, I suppose, to set context. Um, as a kid, I was at first an avid reader, and then at about... I think about fifth grade, I got my first computer and I started programming. Um, I don't really know why that was. I, I was just fascinated in taking things apart and building things. I was very much one of those kids. I was a tinkerer and a builder. And um, when computers came around, I was just delighted by the fact that you could make things using computer programming that didn't cost anything in parts. <laughs> I was always building go-karts and uh, some of you have probably heard the story. I, it's really true. I, when I was in high school, I mean, what a nerdy thing. I, I wanted my door to go up into the ceiling like Star Trek. And so I cut through the ceiling joists in my house. This is in Southern California, you know, got to reduce the resale value. Earthquake territory. I cut through the ceiling joists and put a garage door opener in my attic, inside the attic. And then when you hit the button, you know, the garage door opener would go off and it would pull the door up. I thought it was the coolest thing. It was funny because the top of the house wasn't a big house. Top of the house wasn't big enough, so the door would actually stop, and you'd still have to duck under it a little bit, even, even being shorter then as I was in high school. 
Uh, so, but the point here is I was always sort of tinkering with reality. I always wanted to sort of change things around and build things. I was just um, so interested in doing that. And so as soon as I started programming computers, and then later, about 1994, when I discovered the Internet, I was completely riveted by the idea that the coolest thing you could ever possibly do with computers would be to digitize or simulate everything and just start over. And I, and I think there was an escapist part of me, too, as a kid who'd moved a lot and wasn't always comfortable, you know, moving to new schools and that experience that probably lots of people here have had. Uh, I, I definitely loved the idea of, you know, a world that, I guess, I, I guess in a in a sort of autocratic way, a world that I made, although Second Life, I think, ultimately drew a lot of its power from it not being, you know, ruled by me. But, but certainly one that, you know, I had the, the, the delight of having gotten to, to build myself and then just to, to create things in. And so, uh, as a young entrepreneur, I was just smitten with this idea that we could somehow do that. And when uh, I moved to San Francisco in 1994 and discovered the Internet and TCP IP, uh, you know, everybody had a different thought. For those of us who were sort of young entrepreneurs at that time, everybody had a different thought about, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do with the internet? What's this thing going to mean? For me, it was like, finally, there's this enormous network that allows you to connect a lot of computers together, and what a person should be able to do with this thing is just create an enormous space and then build into that initially blank and dark space anything that you wanted to. And so that was the, the genesis of Second Life. And, and that was like what I was totally into. You may have heard like, I thought of Second Life at Burning Man or a Red Snow Crash. I was nuts about this idea from even younger than that. I was like my late teens or whatever. It was all I could talk about was how we were going to somehow uh, fire up computers news. You know, the, I, the, the, the central focus on people, by the way, and identity, which I'll get to in terms of talking about this, was foreign to me at the time. I was very much a kind of a Lego guy. I didn't actually think about avatars. I didn't even like the idea of avatars initially, which tells you something about me. I don't know. I, I, I was uncomfortable with the whole idea of us being personified as bodies. I felt like, why would we be bodies? And I, I went on to learn a lot about that, which we can we can talk about, but I was, uh, Second Life to me was a gigantic Lego kit. It wasn't full of people. It was full of stuff that people might make. Huge erector set or something, electronics kit. So that was what I was struck by. But then, and, th and this I think has something to say about the future of our own world, I was totally struck by the profound uh, changes that were happening to people and the things that Second Life said about people and their behavior. And I think today, actually, for the last few years with the work that I've been doing, and I guess without explaining, without, without even hazarding a guess as to why, th th there's a lot there. Um, I, I've sort of shifted a lot of my focus to kind of human behavior and transactional psychology and why we do the things we do. And, we, and perhaps we can talk about this if folks want to, but I, I do a lot of work now on, I have this new thing I've started called Coffee and Power, which is a very interesting thing, which is kind of a collision be, almost between Second Life and the real world. Uh, if it, if it, it basically facilitates people doing sort of small jobs for each other with, with a virtual currency, but much like Second Life, that really doesn't, that doesn't do it justice. It's a lot, I think, stranger and, and more interesting than that. But... Yeah, I became, I became fascinated by how it affected people and all, and all that that meant. But the initial idea was this big Lego kit. I wanted to build this enormous uh, Lego kit. So yeah, that was what I wanted to use. That's what I wanted to do with the internet. I was, uh, Salim mentioned that I was at Real Networks before, and I think this is interesting for the entrepreneurs here. Um, when I saw The Matrix, again, I'm just telling stories because i got lots of time to delight you guys and hopefully not bore you and uh, tell you stories. Uh, when The Matrix came out, that was 1997, I think? No, the... F nine. It was nine? It was 1999? Oh, my God, that, that makes this story even better. So it was 99. Uh, I think it was early in 99, right? I, was, uh, I went to it up in Seattle, and I was... Um, with a whole bunch of people that went together to watch The Matrix, and... 
everybody that saw it was blown away in a very positive way by it. And I was kind of, we went out drinking after that, and I was kind of increasingly dark about it. You know, I was sort of like, ah. And I remember there was this story. It was actually retold by somebody else later. And then I was like, yes, I remember that. That's a great, that's a great story about, about this and about me. He, he said, Philip, this guy whose name was Jason, he said, Philip, what are, you, what are you so down on the Matrix for? And I like, grabbed him in that drunken way you do. And I said, because I'm going to build that. And it doesn't turn out this way. You know, it's not going to be like this. One of the things that always bugged me about the Matrix is why we needed the evil machines. A bit of a digression, but, you know, fiction always invokes the evil machines. And every AI vision or every look at the future always invokes evil machines. The machines are always evil and we're not, which I think is a hilarious statement. We're plenty bad. Uh, and the second thing is that it's always like Brazil or 1984. It's always centrally controlled. I don't know why the future is always controlled by one person when increasingly the present isn't. So I don't, I don't know why we expect that there's going to be some, some sort of global autocrats in the future. And it's just uh, unlikely to be the case. So, uh, I, I, but anyways, I remember uh, looking at the matrix. So disruptive technology. And yet, I didn't try to build Second Life, even though I really was totally blown away by the idea. I didn't try to build Second Life in 19... Uh, say, 95, which is not far from 1999 when I actually did start the company. The reason I didn't was that I believed it wasn't possible. I believed that it wasn't sufficiently, the technology at the time wasn't sufficiently compelling to actually build an immersive virtual space. And a lot of companies had tried to do that and uh, had failed. And I think the primary reason, or one of the reasons why Second Life succeeded, or it succeeded some, where those companies hadn't was, uh, was that, was simply that the technology wasn't really there yet. So what was the disruptive change in technology? Because all of you, in thinking about your own ventures, perhaps want to look for uh, disruptive or, well, you know, just sudden new changes in technology that create an opportunity to do something. The two changes that drove Second Life were the emergence of broadband uh, as a, in a, an inevitable way that people, most people, we're going to connect to the internet. That was the first change. The second change was the NVIDIA uh, GeForce 2 uh, graphical coprocessor, for those who remember that. So it's just interesting as a, as a historic footnote that there were sort of two sea changes that happened in technology. In early 1999, if you went to the Dell website and you bought a desktop computer, not a laptop, it was desktops then, amazingly enough, talk about accelerating change and singularity. If, if we all remember, actually, those large, you know, heavy computers, which there are a few of <laughs> still around now, were the only way that we connected to the Internet um, back then, basically. And so the, uh, the G GPU that people had in those things, or sorry, the, the GPU emerged as a standard in consumer computers in 1999. And the second thing that happened was that you knew that broadband was going to go all the way. So everybody was going to have uh, not just high bandwidth, but really low latency. And so I bought one of these computers and started programming in OpenGL a little bit on the side. I was a CTO at Real Networks at the time, and I started playing around with water, actually, simulating sort of uh, 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 simulating uh, water, essentially, moving in a realistic way and being able to kind of move around in the water and see it move and all this stuff. And I was playing with that, and I remember just thinking, it's doable. We can build something like this now, and there's some water in the pictures. So uh, I jumped uh, out of this job at this, by then, pretty big company and told all my friends I'm going off to build this thing. I didn't, it wasn't called Second Life at the time. I just, I'm going off to build a big virtual networked world. Um, in fact, and again, you might find this interesting, at the very beginning, as, as, as less people know, we actually worked on interface technology. And I think this is particularly salient for this class in particular of Singularity University because interface technology is really going through some very interesting changes right now. Uh, in, particul in particular, and I know you guys are probably playing with this, with the emergence of the depth camera, you know, the Kinect and its cousins, cameras that can give us an RGB Z view of the world where we can see into it. Um, I, was, I was fascinated by the problem, and I think this is still a daunting problem in Second Life, of how to uh, put us into a computer immersively, uh, visually, and hopefully perceptually, 
in a way that was better than using a screen and a mouse, like lots of other people, and you've seen lots of technologies around this. And I, I worked on a particular variant of this, uh, which was using sort of uh, what are called strain gauges, for those who have worked with those, and again, there's probably no doubt people here who have. Uh, I, I, was, I was interested in sort of trying to devise a way to put you into a virtual world that, that essentially immobilized you, again, very science fiction kind of a way of going into a virtual world, and used the forces that you applied on a big sort of a skeleton around you as a way of detecting where you wanted to turn and look and everything. And it turned out that actually worked pretty well. But we stopped working on it because the bigger problem, it became obvious, the bigger problem and the bigger opportunity was that, the virtual world itself. That there was no platform, and even if you built a really epic, uh, immersive, uh, interface technology, where would you go? We used to say, what are you going to do, like play Quake? You know, which is what it was back then. Uh, you know, in some incredibly hyperkinetic way. Uh, so we, we, were, we were struck by how that wasn't good enough. What, what we really needed to do was actually create the place itself and, and deal with the problems that would come out of how do you make a place like that interesting. Um, so, so that was what we uh, uh, struck out to do. One of the questions I think about today is, does, does Singularity University and the kind of projects that students would contemplate here in these sort of lofty thinking that we're doing about the future, does it actually sort of fit, I had this thought just earlier, does it really fit Silicon Valley with its funding model? I mean, how many people here think they're going to like, actually, let me ask that. How many people here think they're going to do something that'll be like venture funded? I mean, honestly, right? Like a good bit, like 30%. Okay. You might think, well, I guess you probably know the story, but you know, how many people think that Second Life was sort of venture funded right from the beginning? <laughs> well, it really wasn't. Um, and this is an interesting piece of advice. If you're genuinely trying to exploit uh, really disruptive changes in technology to do things that are completely novel and new that people have never experienced before, uh, an interesting word of advice to consider is that those things are typically not venture funded. It's really hard to get venture funding for an idea that is completely new or that exploits an anticipated or a very new change in technology. I always think that's a fascinating subject for conversation to come back to. Uh, so Second Life was that kind of a thing. It, it actually wasn't a whole bunch of smart investors right from the beginning in this carefully manicured strategy and some great PR or whatever. It wasn't anything like that at all. We used to, when I told Jim Breyer that talk about quantum tunneling, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure, and looking back on it, and I still know him, I'm sure he just was like Rosedale, you know, I mean, just, the guy's crazy. You know, what is he talking about? Uh, in fact, all the investors we went to in the early days of Second Life were not interested at all. I, I remember one of my friends finally confiding to me, Philip, they only ask you back because it's funny and interesting to listen to you talk. They don't intend to invest in the company. What a sobering thought. And some of the people here, you guys who are thinking about all this stuff and sort of telling your own charismatic evangelical tales might consider that in your own investor meetings. Uh, it's tough to really do things that are totally new. You'll generally need to finance them yourself. You should be scrappy in the way you approach them. Raising $10 million to follow the next big idea in, in this kind of technology that you guys are steeping in here, uh, just because it's an up market, I wouldn't suggest that. You won't be able to follow that funding on with new funding. You will not be able to do it. You have to be pragmatic. You have to be very entrepreneurial. You have to prove things out bit by bit, um, take tiny steps. Uh, wander, uh, you know, be willing to obviously take as big or bigger risks than the ones that led you into the idea in the first place. So just a few thoughts about entrepreneurship. Yes. Can I ask a quick question, a comment and question, I guess? Like, a lot of this work is very, very impressive and very creative, and um, I think it's, as you alluded to, a lot of opportunity for escape and indulgence and experiencing things that we don't get to experience here. And I'm sort of struck because in the last few days we've been hearing a lot about people that don't have enough to eat and are in extreme poverty. And I think a lot of the people here, we're here sort of with the spirit of impacting those people. And I wonder if you might be able to offer us comments on how a platform like this. Sure. 
Absolutely. So, so if the question is right, what does what do virtual worlds and something like Second Life have to do with the the the, the last billion? Which I think is why we're, a lot of us are here. So uh, that's great. That's actually the kind of segue I was looking for. So let me take that on. One of the most one of one of the things that I'm most personally passionate about is getting virtual worlds into the hands of people in far away parts of the world. And the reason for that is economic and creative in nature. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, most, well, most human opportunities to draw yourself out of poverty, to, to create value of some kind that, that might enable you, uh, and I think most people believe that this is the general pattern of things. If you look at folks like Kiva and micro lending in general, all the, all the stuff that's going on there. What we believe, right, is that the secret to the world kind of growing up in, this last, in its last few steps, hopefully toward everybody being on a reasonably good keel here, is empowering people at an individual or a highly local level to be able to do things that are of value to other people. Essentially putting them into some kind of a marketplace, whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, delivering milk or, or, or making textiles or just doing something that they can do that's of value to the world around them. So the question then becomes, well, Practically speaking, what are the problems with that? And we know there are big problems like you need drinking water, right? But even, if, even once we've dealt with drinking water, with clean water, which is obviously one of the world's great challenges right now, we then get on to the next stage, which is to what extent does the environment immediately around you in the physical world allow you to succeed? And I think the answer there is that at least for the time being, and that gets back to my initial comment about are we trying to digitize the world or fix the one we're in. Digitizing the world as a way for people to jump in through hopefully increasingly inexpensive PCs and get into that virtual world is, I believe, potentially extraordinarily valuable and I bet you highly impactful in the near term as a change agent because it will empower people to make money in remote locations in a way where they can employ skills that they may have, whatever they may be, to make money globally uh, in a way that cannot be taken from them locally. So when you look at the perils of you know, village life in Africa, for example, a lot of that is you may be in a situation where you are extraordinarily at risk by the combination of a lack of natural resources that might allow you to do something which you otherwise would have the skills to do, or the or and or uh, the sort of slavery of local I'm just going to say like local dictators that can restrict your access to the means by which you could create something of value. I don't know if that's long-winded, but the virtual world is very interesting though because it can potentially at the scale of the mobile device put everybody into an environment in which they can do something of economic value for someone else somewhere else in the world regardless of what the people near them say about that or attempt to do. And I think that th though there are pro there's promise and peril in that change, there is more promise. I think that people are empowered by that sort of economic access to a very large pool, so to speak, of people to sell their capabilities to. So I believe that that is what has already happened in Second Life. For example, um, there are, you know, to, to, cite, to cite specifics, um, Second Life has created architects, a number of them. There are a number of anecdotes about this. Uh, I remember one in particular, a woman who was a, uh, a concert musician in London, and she told me the story of how she was going to architecture school because she had uh, started building buildings in Second Life. Now, it's easier to start playing around with essentially creating physical structure around yourself in Second Life, obviously, than doing it in the real world where you have building codes and general contractors and the requirement that you pass a bunch of tests and stuff to do that. So she was re recounting to me how she had always, as like a little girl, kind of fancied the idea of architecture, but it just wasn't, a, it just wasn't something that she was going to do. You know, It just wasn't on the radar for her, and so she became a musician and then came back inspired by Second Life and her economic striking economic and creative success there in building uh, buildings and furniture and things, she went back and got her degree in architecture. So that's an anecdote, but there's a lot of stories like that. There are countless in Second Life about how people's lives were changed by an increased access to uh, uh, opportunity. 
and let me say another thing I'd written down here about that creativity. So what, what do we learn about ourselves from virtual worlds that we sort of didn't already know or that, were, that was contentious? One of the things we learn is that we are profoundly creative and that we enjoy creativity to a much greater degree than we all, I think, as a human society right now have, in the present day have come to believe. And I don't know whether this has always been true because I think the big thing that's affected it is, is broadcasting. Um, technology in its, the, uh, sorry, the technology of media in its infancy has been a one-to-many technology. And of course, we all know that you know, sort of Web 1.0 was a big step away from that and sort of Web 2.0 with all the you know, even greater focus on individualization and person-to-person -person communication really takes us away from that. Broadcasting required that we create content and then send it to everybody all at one time. Ever, so, so the only economic way to get stuff to people was if you guys all watched what I made. And so you very naturally came by economics, not by reality, to this situation where one person entertained many. One percent of the people were creators. When Second Life got started, and we let people in, it was like 50% of the people were creating the content that 50% of the people were consuming. It was a big difference away from conventional broadcasting. And we always thought, well, well, these are early adopters. And in fact, we, we always had this metric, and we had different ways of measuring it in the system. We'll know when Second Life hits the big time, when it goes from 1,000 people to a million people or 100,000 people, because what will happen is the number of people that are creating the content will drop to almost zero just like the real world, and everybody else will consume it. And what happened was Second Life did scale in about 2006 to a lot of people trying it out and using it, but that percentage didn't change. Everybody kept creating content. So one of the things that was odd and interesting was that the human, the human mind and our human interest uh, seems to be substantially more toward creativity, and you actually see it in some of these pictures, than we would think. We all want to be creative, and we actually enjoy being creative if we have the right tools. And that goes back to that idea of working with atoms versus working with bits. If we work with bits, basically, we can make the tools easier. You know, If you want to build something in the real world out of wood, you have to contend with the fact that you're going to use things like bandsaws. And bandsaws, by the way, can cut your arms off. They're, they're, they're dangerous. They're expensive. They're hard to use. And if you're an artist thinking about shapes in wood, they're not really... They really shouldn't be part of the problem for you. You should just be able to make things in wood. But, but we can't actually do that in the real world. In Second Life, we can. And so when you reduce the barrier to using creative tools, what we see is that people are much more creative. And so that's something that's quite fascinating. People are also, and here I'm just kind of taking that question. I hope that was a, an answer of sorts, at least, or a thought. Uh, people in Second Life also tend to be uh, a lot more iconic than we are. And that's another interesting commentary, I think, on things yet to come. Now, this room, looking at everybody here, is, is, is a pretty iconic crowd, but I think I know why that is, um, you know, given the selection bias of you know, who's going to end up here and why. But the world, by and large, is still a lot more homogenous in its appearance, the real world, than Second Life. In Second Life, everybody is... Uh, it, it seems everyone you meet, even though they're all trying to be beautiful... They're, they're beautiful in a distinctive way. Uh, they're, they're, they're much more iconic or iconoclastic in their look than in the real world. Yes? I actually have two completely different questions, but one of them kind of relates to that. Um, I sort of had you introduced me to Second Life yesterday, and it's I'm fascinated by it. Um, but one of the things I noticed is that unlike most people who get pink hair, I'm getting pink hair because it reflects the way I am in the real world. And I think <laughs> the real difference between... Um, my desire to replicate myself in virtual space and the desire of, of other people to maybe create something completely different or how they want to see themselves. And I thought that that was a really interesting view into my psyche, that I would do that. And I'm wondering how you've observed... So do you mean that you would seek to create yourself... How do you think your avatar would be different than the people here that you see? Well, so, I mean, like, I went, I went looking to get pink and purple hair because I have pink and purple hair and it's like okay well that's not quite how my body is shaped I wonder if I could like change you know and I, I, it's like I wanted to replicate myself in a virtual space right that's not what you normally hear people say and uh, I, I stopped and I, I sort of looked at myself from outside I was like oh isn't that really interesting if that's what you want to do yeah this other thing so I'm wondering if you if you've seen that or or, or considered that before, like how that Right. 
Well, yeah, and let me, let me try and answer that and see if this is suitable and we can talk about it more. Um, one question is, is Second Life entirely sort of escapist? In other words, are all our avatars nothing like ourselves? Do they represent a kind of an unsustainable fantasy about who we really are? And actually, that's not true at all. Um, there have been a bunch of psychologists that have done studies, and a, a lot of studies that have been done on people in Second Life. What it actually turns out is that people tend to be, and here I certainly generalize for Second Life is wonderfully weird, you know, and it's got a little bit of everything. But people, by and large, tend to create avatars that are essentially a kind of a hyper-extended version of themselves. So, for example, people tend to actually have kind of roughly the same look that they do in real life. But, admittedly, it is improved, and I say that word carefully, and that's a whole other conversation, or, or, or maybe one over beers later. Um, by the way, uh, if you don't know this already, and this is just a totally nerdy topic, but um, beauty is the average, the statistical average of physical morphology, particularly in the face. I don't know if you know that, but it's one of those, boy, a um, hundred companies can be built out of that, and dozens already have. That is to say, um, what I mean by that is, if you average everybody in this room together by doing a 3D uh, surface scan of their face, and actually you can include all the guys and the girls together, it doesn't really matter, um, you might ask the question, what does that face look like? And curiously enough, the answer is better than any of us. That face is the most attractive face in this room. And that study's been done actually since 1900. Now we can do it in 3D with scanning, so we can really kill it, but uh, we can really be sure. But it turns out that there, there's actually a company that just sells what's called the mask, which is the ideal face. By the way, it doesn't vary across the world either. <laughs> The morphology of the face is virtually identical. So we're all looking for one face, which is the average of all human faces. Fascinating. So yeah, we all move toward that because we know where that is. That's what I'm saying. We all have an intuitive sense of beauty, and it's the same for all of us. It's not eclectic. So yeah, we're all kind of pulled by gravity toward good looking. Uh, or Angelina and Brad, look at that, how perfect that I should look up right then. Um, but actually, we all tend to be a kind of a super highly defined and almost... Uh, I think of it as an almost too high contrast version of ourselves. What's really uh, an interesting question about Second Life is what's, what's a more realistic portrayal of you? And I'm going to summarize here, not just your avatar, but your avatar, your house, and your kind of behavior as a person inside Second Life, or the real you in this room. I think the claim that the real you in this room is the more accurate you is very difficult to defend. So first of all, your brain has been accumulating information about its environment and its surroundings from the time you were a child. It's been changing. Our brains are totally plastic. Are, is the current state of your brain really well represented by your physical body, the physical body that was given to you and basically hasn't changed since birth to a large degree? That can't be true. Also, in a virtual world, because people have a strong identity, an economic identity, and a personal identity, they, 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 they have friends. You have friends in Second Life. Okay, they're real friends. They're just like you have friends here. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I leave it to further debate that that's true, but it is. Uh, you tend to rely on projecting a reliable, long-standing image of something as an avatar, else your friends will cease to know you there, right? You, you won't be recognizable, you won't be comfortable to other people, and we are all social animals. So basically what happens in Second Life, I think for most people, is they create essentially a more at least in some ways, a more accurate rendition of themselves. Now, what does the virtual world, by the way, not offer us? You may be listening to me and being like, God, what an optimist. That's just ridiculous. He's just spouting on. Of course, the founder of Second Life is going to say that. What's wrong with virtual worlds today? Well, there is a couple of things that are wrong with it, but as is studied here at Singularity, those things are getting fixed pretty quickly. The thing that's wrong with it is facial expressions. The thing that's wrong with it is the bandwidth between us. Real human beings sitting in this room with each other, even with me at this distance, even with some of your eyes being kind of bad, you're getting more information from me as I talk than you can get as an avatar. I've given lots of presentations, even ones like this, as an avatar in Second Life in a manner similar to, I think, Ray's uh, projection uh, machine over there. It, doing it as an avatar is cool. It offers me tremendous capabilities. I can look different. I can talk to people around the world at the same time. But what I cannot do is let you see my face. 
And I've come to learn, and we've come to learn from Second Life, one of the things we learn is that the amount of information that we're conveying unconsciously to each other by our clothing, by our body movements, by our upper body posture, by the exact you know, movement of our eyes, it's a tremendous amount of data. <laughs> and we're not getting it in virtual worlds. So what's going to happen there? If I could opine on that, I can amuse you with that if you're thinking about startups based on that. I actually think that we're more likely to use avatars as a way of interacting in the future uh, once they have full, full body capture. In other words, uh, very soon now, and you guys have probably all seen examples of this, very soon now, not in Second Life today, but pretty soon, we're going to have uh, the ability to really accurately reference ourselves onto, project ourselves onto an avatar with low latency so that it does move the way we do. This is true because Hollywood is showing us films, right? We finally crossed the uncanny valley. Hollywood now can routinely show us nearly human or even in some ways superhuman avatars that move. We all said that was impossible 10 years ago. Go and look at the documents. It was the same classic singularity thing. Like I, I could almost do Ray here, you know, and, you know, of, of course, 10 years ago we thought it'd be impossible, but that wasn't an exponential time. We're just now sort of crossing the point where, uh, our movie technology gives us an idea of what we're likely to see in virtual reality in about seven years. The gap between virtual, uh, the gap between what a personal computer can do in terms of graphics and what's done in a major motion picture that was done, you know, entirely animated is something like seven years, okay? So what that means, and I always find this stunning, is these pictures look pretty good, right? But of course they're at low frame rate when you're actually in Second Life. People have tried that. It's not perfect. There's rendering artifacts and stuff aplenty in Second Life. But bear in mind, in seven years, Second Life will look like whatever the best movies you're seeing do look like today. My God, how much will we value the virtual world when it literally looks exactly like through the looking glass into Avatar the movie? I mean, that's just... I mean, that's, that gives me chills, right? I mean, that's just, it should give you chills, right? We will create jungles, okay? I had a wonderful conversation with a guy about this. We will create jungles that we can wander around in in the virtual world, which have a greater, what's that word, like biomass, which have a greater uh, complexity carrying capacity. Biodiversity, greater biodiversity than any jungles there thus far seen on Earth. Does anybody disagree with that, by the way? Because I'll debate it with you if you do. There's no question, though the brain will be hard to simulate, and I actually love and I'm working on that, uh, just, simulating, just simulating a rainforest is easy in just a couple more years. We can do it not in real time in Avatar. We'll be able to do it real time very soon. And there's nothing that will stop us from creating simulations and complexity of spaces that basically vastly outstrip what we can do on Earth. And the reason for that is simply that there's only a thousand watts of sunlight falling per square meter. We can only power so many little critters in a rainforest. We can do a lot more in a computer. Yes? Um, I, uh, my, my name is Giancarlo from Brazil. I did not knew uh, Second Life before. Um, and um, I think there are some amazing possibilities. Uh, as you said, people who get trained get skills by living the second life there. Uh, but th there are some worries I, I have as some person who doesn't know the, the potential of, of such product. Uh, first information I, I do know is one third of the American population, they, they are obese. Mm -hmm. And we see always uh, sexual attractive persons and another information I know is in China and UK, uh, those governments have already assumed that uh, the addiction, the addiction for um, uh, web-based games is already uh, a public health problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I, was, I, I was just wondering, in a country right. when you have one third of obese people yep. and they can be like this. Yep. Uh, what are the administrations your company is taking care for avoiding this to become right. a large uh, health problem, public health problem here in the U.S. and worldwide, perhaps? Right. Well, that's a great question. So are, are we making people uh, uh, fatter and, and maybe dumber as a result of immersing them in virtual worlds, right? Are, are, we, are we making people less healthy um, and less intelligent, which I think is an even greater concern? 
as a result of their, and that, and that would speak more to the UK and uh, if you look at Korea and China with their concerns about online gaming, generally the concerns are targeted at almost people almost killing themselves or leaving their real lives behind in an incredibly bad way um, to go into virtual worlds. But let's take, an, let's take a look at the virtual worlds though that have driven those behaviors because actually they're not Second Life. Um, I don't wish Second Life was doing that, I don't at all. I love Second Life for what it does for people, but the facts are uh, Second Life has less than a million people actively using it. Uh, the worlds that are causing those problems are more than an order of magnitude larger. World of Warcraft. It, exponentially, yes. it, it can, but it isn't today. And that's actually, <laughs> probably actually a part of the answer to the question. Um, I'm, trying to I'm just trying to think how to answer that in what order. Um, let's consider World of Warcraft. Ever, a lot of people know World of Warcraft, right? Pretty familiar with it. World of Warcraft is uh, gambling. It's uh, designed to satisfy, in an online context, our, uh, it's, it's a wonderful product from the standpoint of something that's you know, remarkably compelling to people, but it's definitely like a drug, something to be taken in low doses, because it's a very narcotic and simplistic view of the world. That is to say, the virtual worlds, most of the virtual worlds outside of Second Life that have been created to date are virtual worlds that revel in simplifying the world around us. In other words, wouldn't it be great if it was all just about killing things? If you just had to kill larger and larger monsters and the girls would come to you, I mean, wouldn't it be great if the world just worked that way? Uh, thus far, the domain of online games has been to simplify those experiential conditions and the transactions, so to speak, that people have amongst themselves. And therefore, they're very dangerous because if you hang out in them and you uh, 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 just continue to believe that you can, well, in, in fact, if you go in those virtual worlds and then you come out in the real world and believe that a, a likely strategy for success is to, uh, as, as, as example with sort of Grand Theft Auto, you know, to just sort of drive around as fast as you can and, and you know, work for the mafia, um, you're, you're likely to be, a, you know, unsuccessful and a real problem for yourself and society, which is, I think, why you have governments looking at regulations like that. But what I would tell you is, I think that's very unlikely to be the end state. Because although Second Life is extremely difficult to get involved in, which is why you don't have 15 million people using it like World of Warcraft, it is extremely daunting to get completely immersed and successful in here. Once you are in here, I argue that the opposite tends to be true. This is actually harder than real life to be successful in. <laughs> why? Because when you go into Second Life, for example, and you try to make money, which thousands of people do, thousands of people call it their full-time living, you know, $700 million or so is the GDP, U.S., of Second Life every year. It, it's a living for a lot of people. But those people are in an, they're operating in a financial environment where they're surrounded by people from every country in the world with all of their different cultural affects attached to them. They have to be successful in a world in which almost anyone can make almost anything immediately to compete with you, you know what I mean? Uh, it's an incredibly sophisticated, challenging world. And I think that in general, it actually provides people with a more stimulating environment in many cases than the real world that they're living in. I've often made the argument, if you're living in the outskirts, uh, uh, if, if you're living in a place in the United States or a place in the UK, great example, where you have very little kind of local resources available to you in the way of culture and people and challenges and economic challenges, you're better off spending your time in a virtual world in terms of its effect on you. Now let's talk about health though and obesity. Um, I agree that sitting in front of a computer all day long obviously is detrimental uh, uh, health-wise. And I don't offer an immediate solution for that. I think the sort of E.M. Forster, you know, machine stops, if you've read that short story, view of the world as a you know, world in which we're sort of reduced to sort of proto-human because we no longer have to get up from our chairs. Look at there's Peter here, he's a robot, but he's able to sit down. He doesn't have to stand on stage with me or check it if Peter's still listening. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that view of the world is definitely a, a, a dangerous one. But I wanted to tell you an anecdote from Second Life that was one of my favorite anecdotes, and I've seen it repeated many times, and there have been studies done on this uh, in Second Life and I think other virtual worlds. Surprisingly enough, when people are empowered and challenged to sort of change themselves or better themselves as avatars, there's a curious phenomena where they actually tend, if anything, to become more demanding of themselves as real people. Let me give you the anecdote here. It's a great story. Uh, very early in Second Life, about two or three years in, there was this guy named Max Mondi who was a 
prolific content creator in Second Life, and I think he was one of the people, and I, can, I know you're not going to believe this, but it's really true. In the early days of Second Life, there were many, many, many people who clocked close to 100 hours online a week. A week having only 168, right, hours. Max was one of these people, and he was in a forum, and he got up, and somebody was asking him about something in the forum, and he said, like, I've lost 60 pounds using Second Life. And I knew how many hours he spent online, and I knew he was one of these super content creators. And I got in there immediately, and I was like, come on, Max, what are you trying to do, write an advertisement for us? You know, I was like, that, surely you've got to be kidding. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, and we've got people here that are Second Life users that might be able to nod or, or elaborate on this a bit. Uh, what he said was, well, it was an odd thing. He said, I'm actually mainly a building designer and furniture creator and stuff. He said, but every day, every couple of days, I was always tweaking my avatar a little bit, you know, because I'm a designer. And so, of course, I get into sunglasses. And, and I was always sort of editing my appearance in Second Life, quite literally, to use the expression we use there. And he said, after a year or so of doing that, I was struck on awakening, or I, I was struck in my real life with a question like, could it really be that hard to do this to your own body? You know, because he was constantly tuning himself in this virtual space. So again, I, I can't offer, uh, uh, you're right, I can't offer anything but that we should be concerned about sitting in a chair all day in front of a computer. But I would advance merely the idea that from a plasticity perspective, putting people in an environment in which they have more control over their appearance, outcomes, greater cultural reach in terms of who they're talking to every day, potentially counters that in some interesting ways. And it's not entirely obvious that we're just going to kind of, you know, turn into blobs like that, what was that wonderful, uh, uh, the little robot, right? Wally, -E, right? That was so perfect, right? Everybody was, everybody was just floating around in these chairs. Uh, so I don't know. Let, let's take more questions now, and I'll just go entirely to that. Um, we, have, we have a lot of avatars that are watching this right now, so if you have a question, I need you to speak into the mic. Oh, All right. cool. <laughs> That's Can great. Yeah. Just gonna go All right. Who's gonna? Yeah, do you want to choose then? Yeah, just go. So, Phil, I want to say thanks for Second Life. Actually, the first business I ever launched was in Second Life back in 2007. What kind so, of business was it? Uh, we were trying to do team building for corporates. The idea was to have teams that were working in disparate locations around the world get together and, and build skills in what Second happened? Life. Firewall installation of Second Life. Yeah. So we hard. built the product, it kind of worked, but corporates wouldn't let us install yeah. it behind the firewall. So Still that. early for that, yeah. Yeah. But I, my, my question I really want to get into, one of the other things that you've created, of course, with Second Life is the whole virtual currency and the whole economy. And I know that at The Love Machine, you also spent some time exploring virtual currencies. Can you share with us some of the things that you've found works with that and some of the challenges you've worked with that? and also whether you see that as a potential to influence our current economy and make the world perhaps more efficient. So I think there is an opportunity. In fact, there's an inevitability around what's going to happen with our current economies. Has everybody followed, has anybody here, I'm sure lots of people have here, like been following like Bitcoin? Very interesting, right? Very, very interesting. Not necessarily what's yet to come, but as, as one particular organization or standard, but very interesting to follow. Um, human transactions are impeded by their inefficiency. So if we have to use a credit card, we have to go through a uh, time-sensitive process. Well, first of all, we don't all carry around credit card readers, you know, Square's efforts notwithstanding. We, we don't all have the ability to take each other's credit cards for a person-to-person -person transaction. Uh, and even if we could, it would take about 15, 20 seconds for us to wait for the transaction to be cleared through the clearinghouse that is those transaction processors. Um, and then in addition to that, we pay a 3.5% transaction fee, right? And, and that's true whether we're using PayPal or a credit card. Um, I believe that humans are, human life is going to be changed a lot by a more cash-like ability to exchange value for goods received between ourselves. And so I've been very passionate about virtual currency. Second Life, from the very beginning, has had no transaction taxes imposed on things that people do. And I believe that that's one of the big things that really uh, opened it up. I don't I don't know, I can't say that for sure, but it sure feels to me like that was a powerful change agent. Um, we're playing with virtual currencies right now with this thing that I'm doing called Coffee and Power. And it's basically an attempt to create a virtual currency that people can use to do jobs 
services for each other. So the example with Coffee and Power, I'll just give you this example because it's quite interesting, right? Which is, uh, 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 I'm in San Francisco and I was going to have a meeting, but the meeting got canceled, and so I'm basically standing in Union Square. I pull out my mobile phone and I say, you know, I speak Portuguese. I don't, but I speak Portuguese. If you want to walk downstairs right now, buy me lunch, and give me $20 in this virtual currency that we've created, I'll speak Portuguese with you all lunch. I'll help you learn that language. Now, is there somebody standing, is, is there somebody within one, with, sorry, is there somebody within a 200 meter radius of the center of Union Square who actually would be interested in that? Very possibly. And that's just one example, right? How about this? I'm a fashion designer. I love this one. I'm a design student at the Academy of Arts College in San Francisco. So I'm a good dresser, right? You're a guy, be, I'll be gender specific, uh, in a bad suit up in one of those buildings within 200 meters of Union Square. Walk downstairs right now, give me a little, give, give me a little money for it, and I'll take you in Macy's and buy you, buy you all new clothes. How enviable a transaction is that? That's totally fun. Why don't people do it? Well, a couple of reasons. No signaling mechanism that would let them advertise that capability to do that. You can't put that on Craigslist. It's not real time enough. No currency that would allow them to exchange value easily. Paying each other cash for things like that, you can think it through. There's a lot of psychological reasons why it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel right or work. And trust. How do I know that person who says he's going to teach me Portuguese is safe? But all of these problems can be solved with technology. I can kind of make you into an avatar in that sense. I can give you a virtual currency to use. I can give you Facebook connections. I can give you all kinds of additional trust, show you how many transactions you've made with other people in a similar context. So that's actually what we're doing with Coffee and Power, which is an attempt to fa basically further grow the economy. I believe that humans have not given each other as much value as they can. We're, 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 by and large, we're kind of idled. <laughs> the technology of the world, as, as amazing as the world is, we're not doing all that much per unit person or per unit time. And I think we can do a lot more. And so that's what I'm trying to do with Coffee and Power. And I think to your question, uh, uh, which is coffeeandpower.com is up. You can actually try it out and see what I'm talking about. Uh, but I, I, I think virtual currencies are a big piece of that. So next, qu next, next question there. Despite having grown up in San Francisco, um, I, I have not ever encountered Second Life. And my mind is being blown at this moment. Um, the visual creative range is is pretty staggering. Uh, but I'm wondering, humans tend to do the same things over and over uh, and be motivated by the same things, um, at least in our world with our constraints. Right. Freed of those constraints, as you've said, um, what are the most interesting or surprising sort of evolutions in behavior or yeah. or human cognition that you've seen? That's a great question. There's so many things that have gone on in Second Life. I mentioned one of them, which is everybody's extraordinary uh, diving into creativity, which I think is one of the most, at least uplifting ones to me that I see. We do tend, as you said, to go after the things that we love the most. As, as human beings and as intelligent beings, uh, the, at the core of our intelligence, and I'm working, I'm actually working on this a little bit, and many people are thinking about it now, like what, what is consciousness and intelligence? At the core of it seems to be our ability to simply remember things. That is to say, we are associative memory machines more in time than in space, if you're reading all the latest stuff on that. Um, so as a result, one of the things that I found really interesting about Second Life was our staggering desire to create the world that we already know. And you see that here, right? Why isn't this like Star Trek, right? But then I started thinking about it, and I realized why it was, right? I'll just ask you a simple question, right? You're in Second Life, and quick now. You only have a minute to decide because it's expensive. I'm going to give you either a Lamborghini or a land speeder. Which one would you rather have? Now, of course, a lot of people here are going to say land speeder. But the reality is that you'd rather have the Lamborghini. Why? It's a safer bet. You know it's a status symbol. You know it's a, it's, a, it's a symbol of human achievement. It means so much. It means you had a lot of money to buy it. Good-looking people drive. You know what I mean? Like all, There's all these memories that we have around what a Lamborghini is. As a child, you had a poster on your wall, and you dreamed of someday having one. 
there are so many things that that's true. I used to say of Second Life that it's sort of the sum of all our dreams. I used to say that Second Life was a statistical average, or in its averageness, and, and happily it's kind of less average than the real world, but the median experience of Second Life was the sort of statistical sum of all our dreams. And the statistical sum of all our dreams is a sort of a cantilever Frank Lloyd Wright house on the edge of a canyon in Malibu overlooking a beach with a Ferrari in the driveway and a boat on a dock down below, right? That is the common human dream. And we all know what we look like. We look like that with wings. So we all want to fly like in our dreams, right? So uh, it's interesting that it's, it's that average. But, but what's really cool about Second Life is that people tend to start with safety. They start with the things they know, but then they start to improvise. So that's why you get all of this. And you've seen it in these pictures, right? You get this wonderful kind of you start with beautiful and perfect, and then you kind of start translating away from that a little bit. And I think that has a lot to say about what we're likely to become ourselves in the, in the coming you know, couple of decades, that, that we really, uh, we are pretty experimental. <laughs> we are willing to kind of, you know, start, start with the known and then evolve it and do things with it. This is one of those weird experiences where the pictures appear to go along with what I'm saying. Like, you've seen that, like, the music is synced with my voice. Right, yeah, should we go? Oh, Peter. Hey, Peter. Do I just Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> can you hear me okay, Phil? I can. Just great. Great. So a couple, uh, two questions, uh, if I might. Um, one is I was having a, a conversation with uh, one of our alums uh, the other day who was mentioning uh, an idea, uh, you know, about experimenting with new forms of government because there's very few places on the planet you can go to actually start a country and start a, a new form of governance and see how it works. So I'm, I'm wondering what stories you might have about that. And the, uh, the, uh, second, um, uh, the second question is, you know, where do you see the human-machine interface that will really give us the most exceptional experience going, what's going on, and uh, when do you think we'll, we'll enter in an immersive state sort of uh, timeline? Those are great. So, so the, to the first question, the government, um, there have been a lot of experiments in Second Life. I don't think Second Life is big enough in its user base yet to really start to field collective experiments in society that are, that are going to be the really interesting ones that tell us something about the future. However, there have been a number of interesting experiments. So from the beginning, Second Life always felt kind of markety, felt kind of capitalist from the start, and, and that was by intent. I mean, it was... My feeling was is that a kind of a, a, I guess a more sort of a libertarian environment would be the one that was most likely to succeed, uh, uh, at, at least to work for a lot of people. And so as soon as it started, people would get into these ex experiments in government where they would try, uh, you know, much more like socialist, for example, types of systems. And there's this one place, maybe somebody that's a second lifer here can remind me. There were a couple of communities that you could like by member become a part of inside Second Life that rewrote all the rules around like property and governance and stuff. So they were sort of experimental sort of communes and there was one, it's, it was called New Something and it's just on the tip of my tongue and it was so much fun to watch these guys kind of rail against us as an experimental pod of, uh, of, of, different, of a different form of governance. I would say as a second point there, Peter, that, that um, Generally, it seems to be the case, and I say this carefully because I have to say I say it with bias from my own background, but it does seem to be the case that Second Life demonstrates that market-based systems where people are largely only regulated by economic constraints seem to be surprisingly stable and effective. And, and I think that's interesting. And I, that's not an answer to your question exactly, Peter, because it because it's not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I wish I could give better examples of governance, maybe some other people here who've been in Second Life can, but it's really interesting to see how, for example, the currency exchange in Second Life, which was a largely very open market-based system, Second Life's currency uh, over the past few years, despite the fact that the company has been subject to all kinds of hype and ups and downs and will it survive and where are they now and blah, 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 uh, Second Life has actually had a currency which has changed less in its value against, say, the euro or the dollar than pick any other world currency. Now, that's quite interesting. Like, why would, why would people put their faith in 
And, and why would the general behavior of foreign exchange of currency trading in, in, this, in this currency that was tied to a very kind of unstable small asset be so different? Oh, Peter, I know I look like that. Oh, we've, Peter. Um, to the second question that Peter asked, uh, which was interface devices, boy, it's an interesting time for that. Um, I think that, it, to, to the point I made earlier, I think that the depth camera, the Kinect, and now it's many cousins that are being released as more open, uh, generalized interfaces, is an extremely interesting low latency way of participating in, uh, in, in an immersive environment. It is, of course, not the end. Um, and, I, and I think that people here are probably thinking about that end even more than I, e even given as much as I've thought about it. We still obviously don't have easy ways to talk directly to our brains. Our brains probably can understand almost any way we could talk to them, but we still, boy, it's really hard to send signals into the brain. In fact, getting back to that whole digitizing the world versus being in it, I wonder if we won't create artificial intelligence inside of virtual worlds that's like more interesting than us, faster than we'll get ourselves in there. You know what I mean? I mean, this is just kind of thinking about it, and, and I, I say this not being an expert in that particular domain, but I wonder whether it won't turn out to be really difficult to kind of extract us or connect us into virtual worlds. If you look at the connect, its ability to essentially find your hands and your head and extract what you're doing and put it in real time on an avatar, that's really good. So that's going to be a massive difference. That, I think, could, at the, at the greatest limit, just, just, just talking to give you an interesting idea, Remember what I said about bandwidth? The one thing virtual worlds don't have is that facial capture and bandwidth and postural movement. What if they start to have it? So what does that, what does that set the end of? Business travel. And how big a business is that? Let me wander on that for a minute because you might like this. I had this written down in my notes. Um, why won't video conferencing work? There's an interesting problem with video conferencing. Who here likes video conferencing? A couple people, but again, that's because you guys are trailblazers. By and large, video conferencing is pretty unappealing. One of the reasons why it's unappealing is really interesting, and I don't actually know how to solve it. You know that effect in movies where somebody talks to somebody else that's in prison? And they kind of do it as an effect, right? You know the effect. It's, it's kind of almost like talking on a telephone. It's that thing where you sit, and you've got the plastic between you, and you're talking to your lover or whatever, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And it's across the plexiglass, and they, they, that, that's a pat effect in the movies now. The reason why it is is, has something to do with our brains and the way we perceive ourselves as being separated by a, sh a sheet from the people on the other side of the camera. Don't you feel that way when you video conference? I don't know that we'll ever figure out how to cross that gap. It's an interesting problem. Hang on, okay. or yes, you want to ask? Part of it I know is, is the eye contact thing. Yeah, so that's right. So, and I'm curious also about the other senses like touch and yeah. taste and yeah. smell and uh, where are we yeah. at in virtual reality with so, all of that? So part of it is, so what we just said was part of it is eye contact. That's right. So we're making eye contact. You guys, even with me, we have a stunning ability to perceive eye contact. Indeed, we're the only primates that do it. You probably know that, but... We're the only ones that are sensitive to eye contact. Uh, it's very powerful in our communication, and the only way to do it is if the camera that's looking into the other room is coming out of your eyeballs. And that, that's a really difficult problem. However, it's much easier to solve with an avatar, which is really interesting. Um, the other thing is that when you project yourself into Second Life, and you have to kind of try this to see what it feels like, when you go into Second Life, and well, you guys could tell me how many people have done this but here, but it's probably a lot of you. There's that eerie feeling of being near or sort of in a box with somebody else. What happens with Second Life, and this has been studied, there have been some really cool studies done on this, is I always try to give the example to people that don't have Second Life. Imagine that we're going to hold Barbie dolls, and I'm going to say, this is me, and you're going to say, that's you, and now we're like, let's put our dolls right next to each other. Let's have them kiss, right? What does that feel like to you? Super intense, right? Even as a grown-up, or the idea of like holding my Barbie doll up to your Barbie doll, is a very like, whoa, that, wait a minute, why does that feel like that, right? And the reason for that is projection. You've probably read about this. It's because neurologically, we can essentially project ourselves into our shoes, through our clothing, into a cane, and into a doll, and into an avatar. So the avatar is a point of neurological projection in a way that I think video conferencing is not. And so I think, and, and the other thing with video conferencing is like bad lighting. I mean, it's just very difficult to constrain the physical world to project us effectively across space. I think it's more likely that we're going to project ourselves as avatars 
We're going to get the facial expressions at high latency put onto the avatars in the next couple of years. It's already pretty much doable now. It's just a, taking it from science to commerce now. Uh, and that's going to make an enormous difference in the world. Like I said, imagine if business travel went away. That's, I don't know, somebody in here probably knows it, but it's hundreds of billions of dollars. So let's, let's keep going in terms of, oh, there we go, just pass the microphone around. From uh, the States. Uh, I had a question. Um, we're talking a lot about a uh, completely immersive environment, but with our Singularity U glasses on, I'm, I'm interested in uh, how maybe avatars and Second Life might end up uh, being able to interact back with the real world. Because if, if it is, we're thinking about the health thing, if we're all just plugged in in a room and turned into the blobs, but uh, is there some I mean, what do, what do you think about that? Is there, is there any way that we're not just locked into the computer all the time, but then you start having some yeah. sort of interaction? Well, it's funny you say that. One of the things I've gotten, this is totally random, but one of the things I've gotten really passionate about in the last year, aside from Coffee and Power, is essentially how we kind of interact with the machine world in a fully physical way. And what I mean by that is uh, this thing I started doing a year ago, and this is a total great kind of after this conversation, um, I uh, box. I, so I started boxing, like, like really doing it, like actually uh, boxing with other people. Um, so, you know, American boxing, you know, punching. And uh, I got absolutely blown away by what a fascinating experience that is. It's so novel, and it's such, it's, for lots of reasons, it's such an unusual and intensely physical experience and intensely uh, social. You're in somebody else's space in an, an unbelievably real way. You know, you're trying to hit them, and they're trying to hit you. Um, I actually think that we're going to increasingly use machines to like train our abilities to do that. So if you imagine like fighting physically with an avatar, for example, that, that's somehow projected in, into the space you're in, oh, it's a really striking idea. Like the fact that we can basically sort of move faster or increase our reaction times or play around with capabilities that we have as kind of extended you know, humans or semi-robotic uh, projections of ourselves, it's just a fascinating thing. We, we've been playing with stuff like playing back videos of, um, I, I did this experiment, which you probably love, it really interesting. I haven't even written about it. I want to like write a paper on it. My boxing teacher, I realized that it takes about 200 milliseconds to throw a punch, which is about as long as, as, as you all know probably, human reaction time, the basic reaction time of the brain is only 200 milliseconds. And the time from when I start to throw my jab to when it hits your face, is 200 milliseconds. So you only have that minimum response time to move. And so basically you have to move your whole body out of the way. If you're Muhammad Ali, you know, you're easily able to do it. And a really great boxer can move away for me as a, as a novice. I can, my teacher, for example, I cannot even begin to get close to hitting him. Even from close on, even when if you watch it with a slow motion camera, there was only 200 milliseconds until I hit him. Question is, is really interesting. How is that happening? How on earth does he manage to avoid all my punches? So we d I thought of this experiment. You guys would probably love this stuff if you're into this perception and the brain and stuff. What I realized was he's uh, telling me what to do somehow with his eyes and his body. So we did this experiment where I stood in front of him and I threw some punches and he moved, deflected them as easily as he always does. And then we did this curious experiment where he knew what I was going to do, so we were careful. I stood there and I closed my eyes. I couldn't see him anymore. And I just threw punches like whenever I felt like it. And he was barely able to avoid them. It's really interesting for those who geek out on interface technology. What does that, what does that say about uh, human interfaces? Well, first of all, it says that it, what I was saying before, so I guess I give that story as a reinforcement of we exchange information with each other profoundly and in ways that we do not understand. We are, oper we are communicating with each other at extraordinary bandwidth. But that bandwidth will be simulated. I mean, the idea that there's some ethereal magic data flowing between us through using some, you know, quantum mechanical channel that we don't know about, I mean, that's very unlikely to be true. So we are going to simulate all these things and indeed do them at higher resolution with machines. So I love that idea of like a machine, that what, what would it be like to spar with or to be in a room with a machine that's operated by a human that, but that can move faster than you, you know, it's just, just totally intriguing. Sorry, that's a bit of a diversion. Smith, Michael Smith from the U.S. Um, so I'm just uh, new to this as well. Patty's done a great job uh, in introducing us to this. Is it possible to have, say, uh, the front row seat at the World Cup game uh, in Second Life? How do you mean? 
The well, the, the, you'd be able to see the actual players on the field, but you, it'd feel like your avatar is sitting in the front row seat. Well, sure. I mean, if you look at Peter there w with his technology. Could you sell that same seat a million times? You mean let everybody come? Yeah, and have the front row seat. Sure, and I think that's one of the promise of virtual worlds. Yeah. And what is the theoretical upper limit of, of uh, participants? I mean, could you have seven billion people attend the same meeting like you do in the Matrix and have the ground, Grand Council within Second Life? That's actually a great question, I think. I mean, I think I see where you're going with that. There are obviously substantial technological obstacles to doing that, but uh, it's also the case that um, our ability to perceive people in, our, in the space around us is limited. And so it's kind of interesting to note that beyond about this number of people, or beyond, say, 10 times this number of people, the audience can be infinite, and you don't feel it any differently. But you'd have the front row seat every time. <laughs> Everyone would be at the front row seat in that Not really, because, the, well, the only thing I'd say is the people in the front row here, I have a different connection with them because of my proximity to them and my ability to see their body language, right? So there is that. All I'm saying is, is that the performer and the audience are connected, which is what I was saying with that boxing thing. So there's an intimate relationship that you have with the audience, and you're, you're having it all the time. And, and the farther and farther the audience gets away from you, the smaller and smaller the bandwidth. And so it, it do, there is some, you know what I mean? I, I can't have, I can't perform for 7 billion people. My brain just can't take in that much data. So that's kind of an interesting limit curve. I don't know how that applies to that idea, but it does. I mean, I think somehow. Yeah, I'll come and talk about it later. Do you, do you mind if we bring in uh, Second Life on the screen so they can see the room? Oh, if we can, that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Okay. Sorry, um, hi, Phil. Um, come, first of all, thank you. This is like amazing. And I'm, I don't know a lot about Second Well, I didn't know a lot about Second Life before I came. I'm sorry, I'm Sharon uh, from the US. Um, and I live and work in Africa. And I'm always trying to understand how I take this technology, this amazing technology that I'm being exposed to, and take it back to where I live and work and have it make a difference in people's lives. Um, and so picking up on your thread about, uh, you know, are we here, are we digitizing the world, are we, uh, the, are we fixing the one that we're, we're in, and you said it much better than I can. Um, you talk about the creativity and, and, and how by using Second Life, perhaps there, there's an impact on cognition. And so I would like to know whether or not you've done any studies to kind of begin to get your mind around the impact, um, quantifying it. And, and, and how we could begin to explore using something like Second Life, um, going into developing uh, economies where, you know, people aren't just beat up, they're beat down, and they're lacking creativity. And, and when we're tasked with helping people to unlock their entrepreneurial spirit, so much of being an entrepreneur has to do with innovation and creating. And so much of what we need to do here is to understand how to learn from people in those environments to help us to help them. Um, and so I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but I'm, I'm trying to play around with how something like this can be used to you know, go into a place like Darfur and have young people begin to explore how they can rebuild and recreate the real world that they live in yeah. using something like well, I, Second Life. I mean, just some rapid fire answers. The, the practical problem in Africa is still bandwidth, as, as you know better than I. Yeah. We don't have that much in there. Um, the computers are less of a problem, I think, than the bandwidth. We can, we can imagine getting electricity to rural villages before we can get bandwidth there, right? I think, and I, I assume that's still the state sure, of affairs. It is. Um, and so that's frustrating. Um, Second Life is intrinsically dependent on relatively high bandwidth, you know, half a megabit per second between people, so yeah. it's tough. Uh, going beyond that, though, I think what the opportunities are is, uh, obviously, like you said, uh, creativity, giving people access to creative venues. Letting people reimagine the world that they're actually living in right now is a very powerful psychological idea. Yeah. I think it has been studied a little in Second Life. The more compelling things that people have done in Second Life have been things like autism, where they're actually, the formal studies have been done around things like autism and Asperger's, where you can demonstrate that people, for example, with Asperger's can essentially train in Second Life mm. to work on social interactions and then apply that training. That is to say, you can then test them and show that they are more comfortable and, 
and conversant in social interactions in the real world as a result of doing it in the virtual world. There have been a few studies done on that, but I think sadly, I, I'm sadly, I, I wish Second Life was 10 times bigger uh, right now. Uh, it's, it's good size, but it's not as big, I think, as ultimately virtual worlds will be, and so we're having an early conversation. Yeah. But I, I, I think there are going to be studies that show, like, yeah, the effect of creativity on economic success on somebody in a virtual world. There's no longitudinal studies yet, because Second Life's only been around since 2003, you know, so we don't really, we don't really have too much to say yet. What about questions from Second Life? Or, yeah, if we, if we, if we have any. Hi, Philip. Uh, my question is, if you can tell us... That's weird. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Hi, this is Cynthia from Argentina. My question is, if you have some... Uh, um, if you can tell us some stories about some medical um, applications for this, for instance, for treatment in neurological problems or psychiatric problems. Well, the one that I'm aware of is autism and Asperger's. Um, there have at least been multiple studies done on that. There was an initial study done with adult Asperger patients. It was done by a guy named, initially by a guy named John Lester, who then came to work at, uh, later came to work at Second Life, actually, because it was so inspired by the results, in part. Um, other medical experiments. Um, there have been, uh, there's been a bunch of teaching done. There's been a bunch of medical teaching that's been done, like nursing which is interesting. In fact, that gets back to the sort of thing. When people have less fear around interacting with each other, you can do some amazing things with a slightly lowered barrier to interaction. So for example, nursing is an interesting case of that where you want to apply knowledge that you've learned in medical school, but it's very stressful to do that in a live environment with real patients and real doctors. If you can take some of the stress out, you get better learning. There's a great example is a Canadian uh, border guard that used Second Life to train people for policing the Canadian US border and detecting contraband and stuff and they would actually build the whole border station in Second Life and then drive through it in cars. It was very cool. Or some psychiatric, psychiatric, psychiatric diseases. Yeah, there was a particular one in Second Life that was interesting where they were demonstrating to caseworkers the experience of particular types of schizophrenia where they basically took a, co a hospital uh, area, it was very cool, that was basically a hospital that people actually did outpatient work in for schizophrenia, and they modeled the hospital in Second Life, and then they made it so that when you experience it, you experience it as one of the patients does, with all kinds of like hallucinations and really intense stuff as you walk around in it, which is pretty cool. I don't know how much more time we have, but whenever, like five minutes? Or, oh, okay. Yeah, my name is Emily, I'm from Kenya, and the question I have concerns the norms that you think or the values that uh, Second Life is propagating. I love the, the technology, it's fantastic, and it's really impressive to see that you're even appearing on screen right there. But the question I have is, so how, how does this shape people's way of thinking? It propagates- Norms, yeah. And you, you know, like the women we saw, the women avatars are really sexual and so on. So my question is like, is that the male view or who right. are the developers or who, you know, yeah. I go and pick a body that has already been developed by, yeah. you know. So. Well, so if, if, sexual, if highly sexualized female avatars are sort of driven by the male perspective, you'd expect then that males would be dominant in Second Life in terms of their economic and social success. And in fact, and you know what I'm going to say, because um, you've heard it before in other venues, um, women tend to be more economically and socially successful in Second Life than men. Very interesting. Um, uh, or, or, or not, I mean, it, it, if you study the brain. I, I, I think, and this is kind of a, a final or a, a, a last thought or something, one of the things that I forgot to talk about in norms is, well, people are forced to be a lot more tolerant in a virtual world because one is you don't know what people's real identity, place of origin, race, anything like that is. So there's a sort of a forced level playing field that happens, which is very inspiring, and you watch how people are essentially kind of confronted with the reality of the fact that it really doesn't make a difference where you come from in terms of how likable you are, how economically successful you are, or the like. I've never seen any kind of bias around culture or race or language in terms of people's like success in Second Life. The gender difference, though, is quite interesting. Um, people tend to be their own avatars, gender in Second Life, so if you see a male avatar, it tends to be a male, we could ask the people sitting in here to chime in on that, but uh, we've done this before. Most of the men you see in the audience there in Second Life, m more often than not, they're men and the women are women, uh, are real women. Um, 
so there's a, there's a tendency to sort of, uh, as I said, be yourself, and then you can look at that and you can say, sort of as, as, as classically or stereotypically men or women, which tend to be more successful in Second Life? And the answer is women. Um, and, and it's not a huge margin, but it's an interesting one, and we've studied it a number of ways over time. I, I don't think it's been formally studied enough, but it'll be very interesting to see that happen. I think some of the difference there has to do with the fact that, well, first of all, I mean, there is quite literally no sort of threat of physical dominance present in a virtual world. And, I, and I've talked about this before, and I think it's quite moving. It's, you know, more the subject of a paper or a novel or something, but it, it, it's, it's quite amazing that we believe that we live in a world in which physical differences between us don't mean anything. So, for example, the fact that men are typically larger than women and are therefore dangerous, physically dangerous to them, um, is we, we believe that in the modern age in the United States, in Silicon Valley, here at NASA Ames, <laughs> that doesn't matter. But I actually think that Second Life suggests to us that maybe it does, because in Second Life, uh, that is one of the factors where you'll see that physical size differences between the people behind the avatars just don't drive behavior. You can't threaten somebody in a virtual world because you're bigger than them, or you're just physically intimidating. As somebody who's boxed for a while, I can tell you that you know, you really get in touch with that idea of physical intimidation, of size differences. So it doesn't exist in the virtual world. Very interesting in terms of its effect on people. I think there's a deeper reason, though, why there's the sort of feminine stereotype tends to be a little more economically successful in virtual worlds. And that has to do with dependency and networking. Um, we are now, and, and, and this, boy, I should have talked about this before, talk about the Facebook generation. Um, one of the things I love to think about lately is, could the, could the robber barons of the early 20th century, the Rockefellers and the, the sort of, you know, the classical, that film, what was it, There Will Be Blood, you know, that sort of character, are those characters likely to exist and survive as, say, CEOs of companies in a world with Facebook in it? They're not. Th their, their actions are more likely to be transparent and public, and therefore their companies are more likely to pay the price of their actions. Um, and you can't just move on to the next town and sort of screw somebody else. You, you're, you're always on Facebook. That, that, fa that information about what you did there is going to follow you. And I think that that's very interesting because you can ask the question, do men or women operate better under conditions where there's all these network ties and you sort of can't get away from your past and from public information? And I think there's at least a little bit of evidence thus far that suggests that... Uh, that, that, that women, again, stereotypically tend to be a little bit more economically successful under those conditions. And I think that'll be a very interesting change agent to watch as we see uh, sort of society increasingly be dominated by these highly communicative information networks. That is definitely a big sea change. That, I forgot to talk about that, that is one of the things that is really interesting because what we saw happen in Second Life a few years ago really is happening now with social networks. We are avatars. We are avatars on Facebook and LinkedIn. And that's really interesting. We can't erase those histories. We use them fluidly. We're, 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 we're constantly present on them. We're coming in closer and closer to real time in terms of how much of us is there. Really interesting. OK, so last question. OK, that's, oh, the oh, microphone. OK, cool. Yeah, hello, Philip. This is Eduardo from Chile. First of all, this is amazing. Uh, I didn't know pretty much about Second Life, but what it comes to me, uh, we live in a, in a world that's called Earth, and we're Earthlings, as there are many other Earthlings in the Earth that are uh, animals and so many that we interact with, and it makes our world, we are connected to them and to the nature that's here. So how's it going to be with, with them? Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, how it's going to be in the virtual world with birds, with uh, animals, right, with right. every other Earthling that is really in our world living, and that is uh, how we're going to project it in this virtual yeah. world. I guess nowhere do we see a more stark fear around the digital divide, right, than when we think about the fact that we may go into virtual worlds and leave some, some fraction of the world behind, whether it's people uh, or, as you say, even the rest of the animals and plants and all other living things on Earth. Um, I think that is quite a thought. I mean, it's difficult, I, it's difficult for me to imagine that we won't have some striking division in terms of who gets into virtual worlds and who doesn't, you know, as, as inhabitants of Earth, as you so elegantly say. However, the one thing I would say, which is very much within the scope of Singularity University, is 
I guess what makes it incredibly weird is that we're going to build a new universe of earthlings, so to speak, or of virtual worldlings that exist entirely in those digital worlds. You know, and, and, unless you hold, again, unless you hold out the idea that there is something intrinsically magical about, say, uh, you know, that there's a magical compound that makes us human or that makes animals animals, right, or that, that animates us as living beings, unless you hold out the idea that that is essentially some property of science that we've not yet discovered, then it seems very likely that we're going to essentially build virtual worlds which are larger in their capacity for life of all kinds than the world that we started with. So, so I think there's this incredibly uh, sad thought of like, God, yeah, who in the shuffle, whether person or, or animal or, or anything on earth, do we leave behind as we digitize the world? And that, that is a harrowing thought. There is this equally fascinating thought that we're essentially going into a world which will probably, that could have 10 times the density and number of inhabitants of everything that came before it, including us, which is just a I mean, I just, it makes me smile just from a, oh my gosh, what happens next kind of a perspective. I don't know. But I guess I would just say that it's not so obvious. The only thing I would say is it isn't obvious that any of this stuff that's happening with digitization and with virtual worlds is inherently bad. I guess that's what I would say is I would just, I would just cast a big question mark around judgment placed on that. Even though, as you said, and I think it's very well said, how, how will we relate to the rainforests or, 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 you know, or, or to the animals of, of the real world when we're sort of becoming largely virtual. It seems like we won't. I can't imagine us putting all our, all the world kind of digitizing it. Okay. Out of time? Yeah. Um, thank you, Philip. Great. Thanks, everybody.